Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. We're here today to continue our expectations series, and we're going to talk about two Ravens today, one offense and one defense, and those are James Prochet and Demarion Pepe Williams. Here to talk to me, with me, about them is Brad McGowan. Brad, how you doing? Ken, I'm doing great. I love the series. I love participating in the series, so thanks for including me. No, it's, uh, it's great. We have a lot of voices here. People got to take players that they're kind of interested in. Uh, I will say this is the one with the least potential, I think, to get starting playing time of the groups we've had so far. Most, almost all of them had one, you know, fairly sure starter and another one who was, you know, pl maybe playing for the, the the corner of the roster. Proche and Williams are a couple players who are, you know, a little bit more difficulty in terms of exactly where they are relative to the Ravens this year. So let's talk about James Proche first, if that's okay. Uh, he's entering his fourth season, uh, be 27 in September, and already a UFA after the 2023 seasons. He's one of a large group of year four players that are on the Ravens. He's going to have a lot of guys who are going to free agency after this year. This year is actually a relatively light one with Ben Powers uh, being the major player that they lost. Yeah. <laughs> you made the comment off the bat about the upside of these, of these two guys and sticking with, with James. I mean, so previously I did, one of these podcasts and we did mm -hmm. Bateman, Rashad Bateman and Angela Blackson. And, uh, you know, Bateman obviously has a lot of upside for this team. And, and we talked through that. And um, when we talked about doing this pod, Crochet and uh, Pepe, um, you know, the curious thing to me about them is that they, they strike me. I mean, not to, not to, <laughs> not to divulge too much up front, but they're, 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 kind of similar play, player profiles offense and defense at, at different points in their career but you know yeah candidly i think if if both of these players make the roster like that's a big win for each guy like both of these guys i think are going to really fight to make the roster obviously demary williams is in the second season he's going to have a little bit more leeway but crochet specifically i, I honestly like i think he's going to struggle to make this team I would agree completely. And, uh, you know, one of the things you can you can look at directly is that year four players, um, if you want to figure out who's going to get cut, just look at the year four players. Those are the guys who are – they start camp on the bubble. Uh, you know, you have star players who are not in any danger, and then you have the rest. And the rest of the guys, they're all – you know, even if they're – okay players or kind of on the margin of the roster or they were okay in year two and three they become not okay in year four because of the option to reset those players with players who have more uh option value remaining more more sand in the hourglass of in terms of team control so i uh, obviously with prochet that's a that's a pretty significant issue it's not his contract he's making about a million dollars this year it's what he signed for originally uh, they have some prorated bonus that they've already paid him that doesn't even figure into it, but the base salary is about a million and, uh, is, you know, it's not, he's, he hasn't earned any, any escalators that, that put him out of the Ravens price range. It's just a matter of, do they want to keep away around a guy on year four who had really a disastrous year three? Yeah. His season last year was really disappointing. So, you know, going into last season, a lot of the uh, a lot of the hype surrounding the Ravens receivers, and famously, well, not famously, but in the last offseason, they chose to more or less remain pat. In fact, they traded away Hollywood Brown on draft night, uh, netted them a first round pick, um, <clears throat> which got used them it on a <laughs> exactly used it on the center, but. You know, candidly, um, I, I, I will go on the record to say that I think Hollywood Brown was probably to this point the most one of the most successful Ravens receiver draft picks ever. I mean, it's between him and Torrey Smith to this point uh, as, as to who had the more productive career. I thought, um, you know, Hollywood was pretty effective. Lamar trusted him. And 
at the same time, he was going into his fourth season and they had to make the decision about picking up his fifth year option. And, and frankly, the fact that they were able to trade him for a first round pick was pretty incredible. I mean, Fevery. exactly, exactly, exactly. And so uh, obviously a lot of times we talk about these trades and we say, like, if you can get a guy for a first round pick, it's a no brainer. You have to make that pick. And Linderbaum had an effective first season. I think, you know, you, you've talked famously that I, I've, I've said the word famously a couple of times, my apologies, we but you have it. talked, yeah, totally. <laughs> you have talked a lot about, he was, he was a much more effective run blocker than pass blocker. Pass blocking is so much more valuable than run blocking. And so the jury is out as to whether that was a, um, the, the value in that trade as it pans out as, as effective as Linderbaum's career is. You know, that remains to be seen. Well, All that I, means- I, let, me, let me just start by that's two separate decisions. I mean, because <laughs> because they exactly. traded him for right. 23, they, they could they could have taken Kair Elam and then got their got their center later. You know, yeah. Zach Tom is a guy that I liked who ended up, I think, playing a lot of tackle, but I think he'd have been fine at center, too. So if they wanted to have played it differently, they still could have. And, you know, a Linderbaum. People think I'm very polar negative on Linderbaum. I'm not at all. I think he had a he had a good year to start. I just think it's so misrepresented in the PFF stats, uh, the PFF combined rating stats that I feel the need to talk about it because you know Baltimore fans seem to think he's going to the Pro Bowl next year. It ain't happening, or he's he's he wouldn't deserve it if he did. In all likelihood, he'd take a like a huge jump forward in terms of his play. So you know they had different ways to do it. And I I don't blame DaCosta. Sorry, I I. I'm, I I think the trade of Marquise Brown was a fantastic one in terms of value returned. If there's any complaint about it, it's how they deployed that draft capital on the as they turned it around. Totally fair. And the, and the one thing that I want to uh, I I think you have the point you have made about Linderbaum specifically, and I think this is a very fair point, And I want people to to to, to get on this is that relative to rookie offensive linemen, he had incredibly yeah. successful yes. rookie season. Very true. He had an incredibly successful rookie season. It just wasn't as good as people made it out to be, but that's okay. Mm-hmm. Like the trajectory he is on is a good trajectory. So, and, 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 and to your point though, the, the trade of Marquise Brown netted incredible value. So going back to Proche, why we went down this path in the first place, why I brought this up is going into last season, the Ravens decided that they were going to stand pat. They added Demarcus Robinson late in camp as a, a, one of their uh, low dollar value uh, mm-hmm. veterans to bring in, but they they stood pat with Bateman, uh, decidedly was going to be the number one. They had um, <clears throat> Duvernay and Prochet coming into their third seasons. They had added Keith Williams and T. Martin in the off season to coach those guys up. And, and so the hope was that between what they invested in, in the draft previously, and the coaching that they would have enough in the receiving core to get by. And boy, was it not enough last Mm -hmm. season. It was an incredibly disappointing season. So this year, so uh, we had previously done the, um, the Bateman podcast and the, and the prep Mm -hmm. for going into the season. He had a fantastic start of the season. He got hurt in that third game against Buffalo. And then, you know, was out two games, limped through two games and then was put on the shelf. Mm Mm-hmm. I, I was listening. I was listening to a conversation um, uh, by the Sharp Football guys today, talking about the Ravens' pass game, sans Lamar, over the last two seasons, and why I think this is really relevant in the conversation with Prochet is that after Bateman goes down, you know, Prochet had a chance to step up. Um, you know, I he, he had a couple decent games in 2021. He had a good game against Denver. Uh, in the middle of the season where he had, I don't know, seven or eight catches or so and and, a, and 70 yards. And then he had a good game late in the season. And so, like, the, the projection was going up going into last season for him. But when Bateman went down, they really needed someone to step up, and he was nowhere to be found. And, you know, I, I, was, look, I was listening to some of these numbers of the passing offense without Lamar, and – Last year down the stretch, there were some guys injured, but, you know, uh, Prochet had a chance to impact that. But these passing numbers down the stretch, the offense without Lamar was abysmal. Um, And they averaged 5.3 yards per passing. Each of the last two years. Exactly. Like, this is the last two seasons. And so I just, 
You know, there's, there's, I think the biggest question facing the passing offense going into this season is how does the Munkin scheme impact everyone's ability in the offense writ large? But I just, and, and, and perhaps Prochet is a gentleman who could benefit from that, but he's not put it on tape. Yeah, let, let me unpack some of that, all right? Because because there's a there's a there's a lot to do there, and totally. I, for 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 Prochet, I mean, I think we need to kind of separate what happened in 22, and frankly, kind of flush the toilet on that season, and and just just get it out there. But I, the, the metrics are are absolutely awful, but so is the focus on the field. Really had a lot of trouble hanging with the football, keeping his feet in the right place, including not out of bounds. Uh, but the, 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 the metrics are terrible. Yards per reception uh, were lousy. 0.47 yards per route run. Caught eight of 17 balls. 56.5 passer rating throwing to him. Of that, 39.6 came from the fact that he didn't have any interceptions thrown to him. So it, almost nothing else from, from, from any other contributions. And the, all, the all-time killer is 3.6 yards per target. But here is the other factor here that if you look at 2021, it was only 20, I think it was 20 targets he had. Might, I might be slightly wrong. No, it's 20 targets for 202 yards, 10.1 yards per target, and an 80% catch rate. Now, it, those two numbers, they don't belong on the same r- permanent record of any receiver on consecutive seasons, unless maybe some sort of injury is involved. And and that wasn't the case with Brochet, at least to the degree I know he might've been, he might've missed a game for a minor injury at, at, at some point, but with him, it was a lot of just skittishness, um, you know, lack of focus, not really having his head in the game, frankly, a lot of the time, but the, the, uh, the 10.1 yards per target from 2021 would be the reason why it's not maybe completely time to give up on the guy. Yeah, I, I guess that's fair. However, if I, I'm looking at his 21 numbers, so he has 16 receptions on 20 targets. Mm-hmm. In the Denver game, that was early in the season. They got a W. Lamar played that game, and he had five catches, and I think that's the one where he had 70-something yards. And then they they play that game in Cincinnati where both Lamar and I think Huntley were hurt. I can't remember if Huntley was hurt this. I know Huntley was hurt the second Cincinnati game this past year in 22. I don't remember in 21. I think that was the game that Burrow threw for almost 500 yards. But in that game, he has seven catches in that game. So he's got 12 catches between two games in a season where he had 16 receptions overall. And one of those games was a clear throwaway. And so while I appreciate the yards per target in the 21 season, I, I, I mean, that last game was mostly a preseason game. Like, I, I just, I Wait, mean, the, the week 16 sample. game you're talking about? It was the uh, Cincinnati game where they, where Burrow f- famously wanted to throw for as many yards as possible because I think Wink had made the comment prior uh, when asking about how are they going to game plan against. Burrow, given that they had just game plan well against Aaron Rodgers, and he made a comment that they're not fitting Joe Burrow for a gold jacket yet. And Burrow um, stayed in that game very late and ended up throwing for over 500 yards. I'll have to look up the number. Well, I mean, fair enough, but but uh, you know, he, I, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put away this as a, as an exhibition game in Week 16. I mean, the the Ravens were still playing for their playoff lives in that game, and it it. it was the one ugly game they had, I think, down the stretch, right? So correct, they had correct. a lot of close games, most of them losses, maybe all of them losses. Um, and they, uh, uh, that Cincinnati game was the one time they got really badly blown out. Correct. And I, I, I just, I, I wouldn't put that in an exhibition category. It's a very important game, and it's one of Prochet's best. I wouldn't, I wouldn't toss it out that way. Uh, it, my problem is he just has, he, you know, the number of games of that quality in his career you can count on one hand um, that, that he's, that he had that Denver game and that game. But, you know, the record is what the record is. I don't think it's reasonable to take away any part of his record 
any more than it than it's reasonable to start taking out the the, the targets that were not quite perfect for him to make plays on in 2022 and pretend like that was that's something that should have increased his number slightly. I just, I, I think you take the record as is. I, I, we understand sample sure. size, both of us. We both work with data. You know, yeah. So, so it's it's fair to say, you know, that may not be a reasonable reflection of who he is at 10.1 yards per target. I just say 10.1 and 3.6. The truth is probably somewhere in between. In this case, I'm I'm almost, I'm almost a hundred percent sure that's the case. You know, that, if he had, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the, uh, you, that's that's a that's a fair point. It, you made it. You make a fair point. I mean, it was a it was a game down the stretch in the regular season. Um, I think I think my point is more so that it got a it it got out of hand pretty quickly. Um, Josh Johnson started that game for Baltimore. Um, it was going to be a tough game all the way around, and that's you know outside of that other Denver game, that's the only time he's really shown any sort of upside that I think to your point, I mean, if we throw out the 22 season, um, that's his, those are the two, those are the two biggest upside games that he has had. I, I think the other thing to bring up is in his rookie season, I believe his, his first target was intercepted and returned for a touchdown by Robert Spillane in that first Pittsburgh game. And I believe two out of three. Yeah. His second or third <laughs> target was also returned for a touchdown. So I, I was looking at one of the things I was really curious about in, uh, in this preview is going back and looking at his draft profile and trying to figure out if for both of these players, I think one, one thing that I find interesting is, is trying to figure, Think about how the Ravens viewed them in the draft and what they thought potentially the upside was. And so I tried to the extent that I could go back and look at the draft profile of both Pepe and um, and James Prochet to see what, um, you know, how they how what they were rated coming in, because both of them are a little bit physically limited. And, the, the, and, and it's interesting if you go back and look at Prochet's draft profile, it talks about how when the ball is launched, he's an alpha with ball tracking, body control, and razor sharp focus, which makes him a favorite in contested catch battles downfield. And razor so basically, like sharp focus, right? Which is literally the opposite of the observation you made about him last mm-hmm. year. And I think it's just it. it <laughs> these are some of the comments that I wrote down from his NFL Draft dot com profile. It says he blocks out and extends the catch on short throws. That first throw that was intercepted in return for a touchdown. He like turns around and does a button hook in the middle of the field. And it's a little bit off target and sling cuts in front of him and returns it for a touchdown. Uh, very good win rate on contested catches. And it says, this is, this is, this is from the NFL.com profile, preposterous ball skills and instincts. And I, I'm not a professional scout. I, I, I just, when I watch him, I just, this is, I, I get the exact, I just, I wish he had that. I wish we saw that on the field. You know, one of the things I, I, I try and evaluate talently that much different than other players. First of all, I, I probably put a, a higher valuation on the metrics coming out of college. I won't completely ignore the metrics, even though people say it looks like a football player, the skills are all there, the size, the length, everything. Um, I, I still need to see metrics that are, that are really good. And in particular, uh, on defensive players, I want to see high tackle rates and a low passer rating against, and a, a particularly a low yards per target against for mm-hmm. defensive backs. So we've had people be all over the board there. Uh, the other thing I like to do, and this I think is really is is really valuable, is try and look if you can. Highlights is oftentimes the most accessible stuff, especially for smaller school prospects where you don't always have full game film. You can get it. It's, it's just a little bit harder. But mm-hmm. one thing I like to do is you have a big time player who's had a lot of some good event, like Malcolm Forbes had interceptions. Go back and look at every one of those interceptions. You can do that and see what, what common threads do those interceptions have in, in how they got them. Were they tip balls? Did he undercut routes? Was he playing center field over top of the receiver in cover three? Did he look into the backfield? How's he finding the football? How's he returning the football after he does it? But try and find the common threads in that. I, I think – I literally think there's a group of people out there. First of all, and this is completely supported by clip people 
who want to basically post one clip, give their opinions, and say why they love this player so much. And that's their contribution is, is they, they, they think about themselves in terms of number of reactable Twitter posts rather than what can I really draw from what I'm looking at and the other information that I have to write a, a balanced profile about this player. So anyway, I, I, I would like to see that done better. I, I respect people who've been through some of these you know camps to do it, whether it's scouting academy or other things. Um, I just, I just see so many people shortcutting the process. I think a lot of that was done with Gonzalez. I think there was a general uh, feeling that Gonzalez was a, was a top corner coming out of this draft, and there was too much love for the guy relative to Witherspoon. Uh, yeah, frankly, and it, and, and it just it it didn't make any sense to me. And honestly, I, I I allowed myself to get caught up in that a little bit because Malcolm Forbes and his Malcolm Forbes, Emmanuel Forbes and his size was a little bit you know a little bit small. Uh, but he, he, he was a guy who, uh, has so much else going on that, he, and, and Gonzalez had given up a high yards per target number that you got to somehow at some point, just subvert your own willingness to make subjective judgments about a player based on a few play and look at the whole series of plays. Cause you know what you can't find. And this is true of Prochet too. Nobody is going to set you up a reel with every one of James Prochet's receiving screw ups, not, not as drops, not as, I mean, that doesn't exist. So to find it, you have to look through everything or you have to trust the statistics to a certain degree on things like drop rate and, and, and other things. You'd love to be able to actually find those drops, look at those and see what they have in common in terms of being focused plays and whatnot. But there's very few evaluators who will go to all the trouble to do that. So I, that's my, little bit of soapboxing on on why it's difficult to to figure out what's really wrong and the whole laser focus thing i mean he did catch a lot of balls at smu so you got that the offense is running through him it's the kind of statement you can write on a piece of paper or on a twitter thread and no one's going to disagree with you because hey look at his total stats at smu um but the truth of the matter is the evidence was was probably there in part even there that it that it that there would be trouble at the NFL level. It's just a tougher game. Contested catches are tougher, all those things. I don't think there was probably the evidence of the lack of focus on the field. I don't think that what happened in 22 to him, I think, you know, if I'm not a sports psychologist, but it kind of just seems like he got inside his own head a little bit. And it was really a new problem. If I had to say. That's fair. I I guess I, I, I like thinking about, or just, you know, kind of thinking about the, how, how, how the, the rant you had about, I don't want to call it a rant, but, but what you, what you described about evaluators on the internet and, and just, I mean, even NFL.com evaluators, I think that's very fair. I guess the thing that I was thinking about as it relates to both these players is what is it about them that the Ravens staff the scouting staff which you know the the ravens Mm -hmm. do draft very well what was the thing that really um you know they really liked about prochet specifically since we're talking about him right now what was the thing that made them you know think that this was a guy worth investing now i i I will say i don't i don't think i I was trying i was racking my brain i didn't have time to research this but i don't think the ravens have really had a late round wide receiver later than third round that was even that that was very productive at all. Um, you know, I don't. I mean, I think like I mean, they, they, unfortunately, they haven't really drafted wide receivers all that well in general. But but you know, past the third round, I don't think many of those guys have really performed well. So that doesn't mean that they shouldn't draft those guys. Obviously, you need to take swings where you can, and you should. And it, especially in the later rounds, you're just looking for guys that have upside and. You know, one of the things that we tend to do in the draft is we'll see a guy and we'll say this guy, this guy reminds us of this other former player who famously made it out and and did very well. And that's an interesting way to evaluate. And it's not most scientific, but I'm interested in your thoughts about that because I had one guy. Let me respond to that really quickly because they've they've had three guys who've gone on to have good career that he drafted in the fourth round or later. Brandon Stokely. 
I wouldn't include Demetrius Williams in the group, even though he played a little bit uh, for the Ravens. Jermaine Lewis certainly had a terrific career with the with the Ravens for you know various ways. And was, he's a, he's a great example of a great draft pick because all his value is pretty much on his rookie contract. Uh, and Darren Waller is the third one. And Darren Waller is a weird character who had basically zero value on his first contract, and you know talked about some of the the self destructive problems he had when he was playing with the Ravens and. Uh, honestly, the, the, the Raiders got all the value out of him. So, uh, uh, but the Ravens did have drafted three decent wide receivers. Unfortunately, two of them got all their value for other franchises. <laughs> okay. Ken, there, there is, uh, the, the one thing that I count on you more than anything else is an encyclopedic memory of everyone that's played. I, I wish I could claim that, but I went to profootballreference.com. I literally hit the draft. <laughs> I, I sorted by position and it sorted it by round for me. And I just looked at all the names from four down. It's a lot of names, by the way. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 15, 16, 17, 18, 21 guys they've drafted in the fourth round or later at a wide receiver. So it's not, who, it's not a good hit rate. Who was the guy recently that threw his helmet into the Jordan Lasley? Yeah. The, the, yeah. the football. Yeah, <laughs> totally. So I, I, going back to Prochet, the the one the one name that I thought of uh, that was a late round pick as a comparable athletic comp. This is this is an awful comparison, mm -hmm. but Antonio Brown was a sixth round pick out of Mich Central Michigan, and it, 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 I, I was thinking I was looking at the Raz profile for for these guys because neither of them, uh, Prochet or Demarion Williams are considered athletic specimens and mm -hmm. both of them have pretty low RAS profiles, but Antonio Brown, like curious, uh, interestingly has a worse RAS profile than James Prochet. And, you know, I indulge myself in some of his stats. I mean, off the field, Antonio Brown has his issues, but there was a stretch. He was uh, unbelievably great. You don't, we don't have to even repeat. Great. Yeah, we don't have to. And so, but, but here's, you know, here's, let me, let me tell you what the basic problem is with that. You're trying to compare a player who doesn't really fit the athletic profile of the position with a similar player who's the best ever at his position. So don't yeah. tell me Joe Thomas had short arms and say, yeah, 33-inch you know, left tackles can work just fine. Bullshit. Yeah. Bullshit. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's, and, and don't try and tell me that because somebody else had, you know, uh, you know, an unusual height weight, you know, thing at, at, uh, at Marshall. At edge. Yeah. Marshall Yonda is a good one. I, you know, I, I, I height guys who look like wide receiver at edge, I typically end up being tremendously flawed, even as situational pass rushers. And just ask Aaron Mabin, if you want to want to find right, a guy who, right. who didn't work out, I, it's just, you know, it, it, yes, you can almost always find counter examples in the long history of football of guys. Oh, what about Marshall Yonda? What about Joe Thomas? These guys were somewhat short arm, both of them. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it just stop it. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's the overwhelming tide of, of uh, evidence would tell you this is not the case. And, you know, even, even with Linderbaum, you know, I tried to show the other guys who had been comps to him and the guys with longer arms had worked out of center and the guys with shorter arms had not, including Garrett Bradbury, who may have turned it around, by the way, but the Garrett Bradbury in, in that group. And, you know, people then say, well, A is not like him because of, me, 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 me. Yeah. you know, you, we talk about this, you know, mush mouthiness starts going yeah. on. That, that, yeah. It's very difficult to listen to. So to anyway. totally. And the only reason that I brought that up is that I was just trying to figure out what it was they saw in his game and you know again like it, it, it's it's a he's a sixth round pick it's worth taking on a, taking a flyer on a guy that was uh productive in college but you know when it comes to the 2023 season you know uh, when the ravens needed bodies last year in the wide receiver core, they signed Deshaun Jackson and they signed Sammy Watkins. And both of those guys in very limited action were more productive than Pro Prochet, who yep. was with the team all year. And so, you know, I was trying to, I know we're going to get to the point of a good and great season. And I, I was just racking my brain, like, what does a good season for Prochet on this team look like? Before we get there, what's, what, yeah. a, what, I, 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 Turn this around now. Obviously, you know, we both can look at Prochet's 2021 se 2022 season and say he was terrible. And I can look at 21, and I'm sure you can too, and say that was pretty good. Or you can say it's too small a sample size. But just give me your – take the counter argument. 
What are your what can be your reasons for optimism for Prochet for this season? I think my reason for optimism would be a lot of the reports that I've been I've been hearing about what Munkin prioritizes in the passing game are precision, um, route running, um, some of the things that that we haven't really seen in Baltimore as far as, uh, you know, just creativity in the passing game that isn't necessarily just predicated on a backyard connection between great athletes, Mark Andrews and Lamar Jackson. So, you know, someone that was really productive in the Raven system for a couple of years was Willie Sneed, who was physically very limited by the yep. time the Ravens got him. And uh, candidly, Prochet reminds me a little bit like physically of a Willie Sneed. And um, if the Ravens offense and passing game is able to do the things that we hope it can do, there is going to be room for a guy that can just make space underneath and catch passes, you know, on a third and six or, uh, you know, move the change or maybe be an outlet on a first and 10 if the first or second read breaks down and you're available on the backside. So to me, like that, that would be, that's, you know, Prochet has primarily in my sort of uh, anecdotal uh, thinking about, you know, thinking about the plays that he's been successful, worked as a second or third option, um, not deep down the field, sort of in the intermediate area. And if, the Ravens' top receiving options, Andrews, OBJ, Bateman, Zay Flowers, if those guys are successful at doing the things that we hope they're able to do, there is going to be room for someone to just find the nooks and crannies in the defense and make catches. Okay. I I don't disagree with that comment, but I don't think there's ever room for a receiver who's the fourth read or the even the third read on most plays with Jackson because plays break down and Jackson then wants to find an outlet and he has his favorites under those circumstances. I hope that set of favorites will increase. And it was better when Hollywood was here because he was peeling the top off the defense and getting opportunities for Andrews. But what I'll say is this. If Monken's offense goes to a read one, read two, that is very well distributed for this team. And I think it should, you know, challenge the whole field. Well, that means you got to throw to the whole field. You, you got to, you got to throw to matchups that are other than one-on-one matchups. You might have a, a number, meaning the number one guy on the number one corner is what I'm really talking about under those circumstances. But you, you, you may have to try and throw to Prochet when you think you can get a matchup against a linebacker and, you, your scheme is all built around, you know, getting profitable first and second reads for Lamar because Lamar's not going to get to his third read. Um, although that's something they really need to work with Lamar on is how do I increase my rate of reading such that I'm still getting a valuable third read? Uh, or how do I read at the line of scrimmage so I can eliminate reads one and three from my progression and just go to two and four right away? You know, how, how can I how can I change what's you know what what's going on uh, there by what I see at the line of scrimmage? But I think you know, incumbent upon him is going to be becoming a better route runner with that. What I haven't really seen too much of from Prochet is real wiggle at the top of the route. You know, he's as a slot guy, he doesn't always get that as a um, option. He'd have much more of that to make a to make an outside um, uh, corner miss. But there's still opportunities to shake a guy, whip route, whatever it might be, when you're in the slot. And I think he needs he needs to show more of that ability. Um, if you're looking for other reasons for optimism, I, I think – go ahead. Well, I was just going to say I think you kind of put me in a, in a tough bind there because you were asking for reasons for optimism. And I – like, it, 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 candidly, like, there are five to six – six guys on the roster that I would rather in that position than what I just laid out, like given the depth of the receiving sure. court right now. So I was just trying to think of ways that he could make an impact. And so put, like so, punt and kicker so, turner. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So I was like curious, what's yours? Uh, well, I, uh, he, he's punt and kick returns that here. Here's the big one. And this is the one I, I'm writing this up and I'm trying to think about how can I be positive about James Prochet? If the Ravens were to lose Duvernay, who is, I think, their primary gadget option, and the reason I say that is, is Zay Flowers is perfectly capable of being the gadget guy. They they can they can run him jet motion. They can do things with him that they did with Marquise Brown. I think in some ways that kind of wastes 
who he is within a Monken offense because you want to stretch the field. You want to get him more opportunities to get safeties away from Mark Andrews, get safeties away from Isaiah Likely, get safeties away from Beckham, who's you know not the kind of separator he used to be. So you you want to you want to have some opportunities to create space. Zay Flowers has got to be down the field, not running orbit motion, not running jet motion as much. So Duvernay then becomes the guy again to to take over a lot of that roles. But if Duvernay for whatever reason is not available, and of course he was hurt last year, I'm looking at the team in terms of who's the next best guy to do it, and it might be James Prochet in terms of of uh, who they have right now. I mean, he's, he's, he seems to have some of those characteristics. I don't believe he's fumbled yet in the NFL. Not too many total touches, but. Uh, but that's something, and you know maybe that's a maybe that's a way he could help the team. And then, uh, you know, I think if if I were to put one other thing, he plays on three of the four special teams units. It doesn't quite make him a core special teamer because he's not on the punt coverage unit, but he's on the other three units. And maybe that's enough between those elements. But if I were Prochet and I'm coming to camp, the first thing I want to do is. Monken, I'm I'm there for you in whatever way you need me. If you want a backup guy to shadow Duvernay in all of these um, uh, gadget concepts that you might normally run with him, I'm happy to do that. Uh, but you know, it, something of that nature is what I'd like to see from Brochet because I don't think it's going to be a normal receiving route for him that is going to be profitable. That's totally fair. I would say of the guys on the roster that could be that backup gadget option, I would rather have Isabella Okay, as that guy. I mean, he has the athletic profile of a guy that can do that more than Prochet. And I, I mean, that, that would be the guy that I would think would be the natural fit if we were just talking about a gadget kind of backup special teams guy. Is he, is he actually still on the roster? Yes, he's still on the roster right now. There you go. Uh, he's yeah. a, and, and there's no difference between the two at this point. A fourth year guy, a fifth year guy. It's a you know, it's a yeah. vet salary versus a and and candidly, when he was getting drafted, I think uh famously in, in high school in Ohio, he was the sprint champion over who is the uh who is the number one cornerback in um in Cleveland that uh, uh Hayden was- not, not no 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 I'm sorry not I mean him. Ward Ward yeah Ward uh, Denzel Ward uh, yeah uh, Isabella was uh, like uh, an elite sprint athlete that beat Denzel Ward uh, in the state championship and so like he has the athletic profile for okay. a guy like that great counter on that so let's talk about a good and great season we've gone way too long by the way in James <laughs> Roche so we need to speed we it up a little have. bit for Pepe but sure. uh, a good season what is it to you. So I think a good season for him is that he demonstrates enough progress in camp uh, and in the preseason that he is a priority that he he's likely going to get cut and he's a priority resigned uh, 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 on, on the practice squad um, that if a guy goes down in front of him that he can get elevated off the practice squad. He can fill in with depth. He uh, there's not a, a whole lot of drop off if he's on the field and some of these situations and, you know, he proves that he is capable of being on an NFL roster. I think that is to me a good season for him. Okay. I think that last point is different from what I have, but otherwise I think I'm, I'm in lockstep quality preseason keeps him in the Ravens plans, makes the practice squad is available when needed. That could be to start the season because Hey, Bateman, we're not sure if he's going to be ready to go. So there's good. There might be another spot in the wide receiver room. Gadget play gets him on the field for several packages per game. And again, you might be right. Isabella might be a better option. And, and uh, you know, we certainly saw Isabella run jet motion, a fair percentage of the plays that he was actually on the field to, to the point where it almost became, you know, a, something you could call out from the stands. And I'm sure the advanced scouts, you know, could have coached the opposing defensive coordinator on this as well. Uh, so, so there's that, uh, I think improved on field focus. He's just gotta, he's gotta be more aware of where he is on the field, obviously, and what's going on and, uh, avoid setbacks such as fumbles. That's, that's all I've got. I'm not, I've got no specific performance expectations that go with that. Just that, just that he, uh, is still in the Ravens plans due to that preseason. Sounds good. Give me a great, great season. Great season. Great season is that he shows enough in camp and in the preseason that he is legitimately in the mix as the sixth wide receiver, potentially to make the team out of camp 
Um, you know, Tylen Wallace probably at this point in his career offers more in special teams. So I anticipate if they keep more than, what do they have, five? If they keep a sixth receiver, he's probably the likely one, assuming no one gets hurt. Um, but if Prochet is in that mix and he's uh, legitimately fighting for an opening day roster spot, I think that's candidly a great season for him and all of the other things are the same. So I, I would agree that Tylen Wallace uh, also, because he's a year three player is in a better position than Prochet. And I, I would agree with your comments about uh, him as a special teams player. Certainly. Uh, I'll, I'll just tell you what I have for a great season for uh, Prochet is the wide receiver depth breaks down. This is obviously not a good c- scenario for the Ravens age lingering issues, I think make that more likely than we want to admit, but you know, you have some older players in, in Beckham and Aguilar, and you have some guys who've already been injured in terms of Duvernay last year and Bateman last year uh, and Bateman maybe still right now uh, that could make this a, a, a significant problem. And uh, if he gets another chance via that mechanic gets on the field, plays 150 plus snaps and returns to a reasonable level of per snap productivity, somewhere between 21 and 22, where he's maybe at seven yards a target. Not completely terrible, not necessarily what you want, but uh, but gives the Ravens a little something in the absence of their primary receivers. That's fair. Okay. How about we move on and talk about Pepe? Let's do it. All right. I hope people are going to still want to listen to this episode after <laughs> – <laughs> after some of the negativity involved. So uh, uh, he's entering his second year, drafted in round four in 2022. Uh, DaCosta was on film, mic'd up, whatever you want to call it, uh, during the draft, and they did have a chance to trade this pick to get two picks later on. There was an offer on the table for it, if I recall correctly. Uh, Pepe had a great preseason, really had high hopes of who he might be, and one of the nice things about him was some versatility. He played some slot corner and some free safety in that preseason. Looked good. And, uh, you know, one of the things I thought I saw, at least in the preseason, was that he played longer than his size. A really good reach across the body um, for a guy who had 29-inch arms or, or thereabouts. And, uh, you know, obviously size is going to limit the guy in the NFL. But that's something I thought I was picking up on. Yeah, he did have a... I, I mean, he was a curious pick. I, I, again, I don't want to say negative. I don't want to say negative on this podcast, but when he was drafted last year, I remember looking him up and reading. I can't remember. I, I don't want to get into that. I think the, the famous thing that we've well documented is Tariq Willem was still on the board. Tariq Willem was 640, he ran a 426, mm-hmm. and he had limited experience in college. And you've talked a lot about how these aircraft carrier corners are hard to come by, and that seems like an obvious guy you know i mean i just listened to your podcast that you had with boss where you guys talked about jad uh-huh. and the ravens were really high on jad that was the one guy they really wanted in the fourth round and you know it wasn't an uncommon consensus i mean chris sims i i, I read I, I watched this like pre-draft in 22 um cornerback profile and he had jad as a top five cornerback uh, candid, uh, uh, prospect and one of the biggest sleepers in the draft. So there were people that felt JAD was going to be, uh, you know, had a lot of potential. And so they drafted a guy with a lot of physical tools uh, with their first fourth round pick and they came around and they got um, Pepe later in that round. And, you know, he kind of profiles kind of similar to Tavon Young um, and, you know, candidly to the Darius Webb. He's a little bit uh, shorter arms, actually a lot. Okay, you're doing arms. it again. I'm just going to say it. And, 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 that, and that's okay. That's okay. But those guys were both great players for their size and complete outliers on any charted mapping of sure. guys who are 5'9". And that, that, that's <laughs> totally up. fair, except yeah. for Pepe has a better RAS score than Tavon Young because I was racking my brain again. Like, why would they take this guy? And and and, and Tavon, Tavon was... was was man his rookie season he came in and started on the outside and did yeoman's work uh, i mean he was a fourth round pick at a record anyways but i was just trying to figure out like what they saw in pepe and I, I i watched some of his highlights from last year and there were some there were some plays that he put on tape that were pretty impressive especially in that miami game um, where he I, I, there was a couple there were a couple plays where he was in the slot manned up on tyreek 
and had no business getting downhill to make an open field tackle where he did that and he did that well. And coming out of college, that was one of the things about him was that he will get downhill and stick his nose in there. And that's the thing. I mean, Ladarius Webb. It's a slot corner trait. No doubt. Exactly. We've yeah. talked about this. Ladarius Webb was the best cornerback in the league for that stretch where he could play in the slot and get downhill very quickly. And he was exceptional. Well, it's actually Lardarius Webb was great playing the outside too when he was the best cornerback in the league. But you're right. I mean, he's a great, he's a great slot corner later in his career. And and when in earlier in his career, he would play both and and alternate on a down by down basis because the Ravens didn't really have a better option at slot. But when they had four defensive backs on the field, he was back on the outside again. And that was the year he shut down Andre Johnson in the playoffs for Houston. And just had, a, had an unbelievable year with a 42 passer rating. Against I mean, he but he was the guy that would play Antonio Brown when he was in the slot. He was mm-hmm. the guy that would play Welker in the slot. Like he was the guy that we counted on to handle those really crafty route runner guys out of the slot. And so, you know, let, 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 playing this forward to Pepe, when you look at the 2022 season, Baltimore, you, you know, if we step back, look, Baltimore had. Um, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. They had really kind of a bizarre season where the offense started on fire. Mm-hmm. And then second half of the season was a mess. And the defense started a mess. And the second half of the season was on fire. And Pepe played a, a large portion of the snaps for the first eight games or so. Yeah. And then as soon as Roquan was brought in and they moved um hamilton into the slot like pepe was basically shelved and didn't play significant snaps the rest of the season right i mean he he lost the role to hamilton right but he he also he took the role from jad and stevens that new england game a hot mess and you're right the miami game he, he actually played pretty well i thought despite giving up two touchdowns in that game uh, you know, 10 targets for 42 yards. It wasn't like he he, he was awful by any stretch, but uh, but it didn't completely work out either. The next week, J.A.D. looks completely lost in covering yeah. Devontae Parker. And then Stevens went in trying to do the same thing. He couldn't get it done. And then they finally put Pepe in. And, uh, and I, you know, I thought after that that Pepe really looked like he was going to take over the slot corner role for the rest of the year. But the Ravens found the better answer. And, you know, they got creative in terms of using Hamilton there and just put him in slot corner and said, we're, we're going to roll with this. And it was the right move. There's no doubt about it. And I think we I want to I want to move forward from here, because one of the nice things about Pepe is one of the things that you know leaves the door ajar for him is that he has the slot corner characteristics. If I if I look at the guys on the roster who can do it, you have Hamilton certainly could do it. You have. Humphrey, who they could, you know, would be making a sacrifice to move him to slot, but he could do it. And you have our Darius Washington. And I don't think there's anybody else in the whole group who really fits the role. You know, could somebody m- claim that Brandon Stevens would be a legitimate corner? Well, I guess if, if, you know, if, if Hamilton with his hulking size and, and limited speed could be a value to you at slot, then you could make the case why Brandon Stevens could be. But I don't think there's a good reason why, Instinct wise, reading the quarterback, downhill movement, the tackling ability. I don't I don't think there's another player other than um Pepe and Ardarius who is really a, a legitimate SCB candidate. And that's some of the, what I want to talk about on the rest of this episode. But where are you? Is there is there another SCB on the Ravens current roster? So Hamilton is an outlier because his instincts are just so exceptional. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, I've heard, I've heard you talk about this a lot and I am, my personal opinion is that I am not entirely against moving Humphrey to the slot. I, I, I like his physicality there. And, you know, I, I heard you say this on the JAD pod about, Um, you know, his, uh, physicality at the catch point is really valuable on the outside, Mm -hmm. but I am specifically thinking about the 2019 overtime win in Pittsburgh where he, um, he punches the ball out in overtime against um, Juju Juju. And I believe that play started in the slot. I think he was just following Juju around that game. 
and I could be wrong about this, but I think, you know, the one it, the nice thing about having him in the slot is giving him a little bit of space to then come in and bat that out. And, you know, the, uh, you know, again, like the year, the year the Rams won the Super Bowl was the year that they moved Ramsey to the star role where he was playing a lot in the slot. And, you know, I just think Marlon's physicality and I think the way that the modern game is played with these big receivers in the slot you know, the Justin Jeffersons of the world that play primarily out of the slot and the Cooper Cups of the world. Like, I, you know, I, I'm not opposed to having their best corner be in there. Now, the biggest issue is injury, which we can't afford with Humphrey. And right. so to answer your question, I, frankly, I don't, I, I don't really know what they should do. And that leads me to a question I wanted to ask you is if the Ravens can make one move to bring in an outside veteran at mm-hmm. either corner pass rusher or receiver which position do you pick yeah you're 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 a little bit stepping on my material here because i wanted to wanted to frame it up differently but i'll try and answer your question first let me try and answer your question first i i do think they've got one move coming at cornerback left i think it's going to be a right player right price move so they might look they might get an outside cornerback if that's the guy they think can provide real value to them and i think marcus peters be an excellent choice i think it is a matter of price at this point for marcus uh, I, I think they're fairly well convinced he can play. And it may be even a case of Marcus doesn't really want to go to camp. Mm-hmm. And and he'd, he'd like to show up and play football, but not not really go through camp. I know Justin Houston kind of wasn't a real big fan of doing that either. So right. I can understand maybe why why some of that would be true. Um, I think they can go they can go slot corner. And if they can get a guy around two, two and a half million who has either some sort of pedigree or or real hope. Uh, th- that he could play the slot well, uh, fits the Ravens' mold otherwise of being a good downhill player, contributes some in multiple ways. I think they might try that. Uh, last year, Fuller was a guy they tried to fit in that mold. Now, Fuller had lost his slot job twice the previous year in Denver. So it didn't seem like a high probability call to do that, but that's what they rolled with. And he was actually playing pretty well between the preseason and that first game before he got hurt. So, you know, I, I could understand if they did that. Um, I, the only other thing that I'll say about this is the decision on Hamilton. And I've said this a couple of times already. So you probably yeah. know because you listen I wanted to, to the a- podcast. I wanted to, a- I wanted to ask you about that. Well, go ahead. What am, what am I going to say? The decision on Hamilton, what? So you, you <laughs> so what you said in the J&D podcast is the Ravens need to decide. Like Hamilton has a chance to be a true star. So they need to put him in the best position to be successful yeah. and let all the other pieces fall where they may. Perfect. I, I, I could not have said it better. And you said I, it in fewer words. Yeah. But I thought that was an interesting point because and football is a weak league sport. And so if – if 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 Stone is clearly the the fifth best defensive back on the roster, clearly, uh, I, I, how do you make that decision if 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 it means you play three safeties and two corners? Like I I you know that that's that's something that I I, I was thinking a lot about that. Yeah, because um, I I just I think I think you say um, Hamilton is a. Uh, let's say you have your you, you have you think of it as a number of units above average that you have in total to allocate to your defensive backfield, and Hamilton gives you plus ten at slot corner, but it gives you plus thirty five at uh, you know strong safety, and Stone gives you plus ten, and Pepe gives you minus five. You can't let that decision yeah. overpower the, the the difference you get from Hamilton. So it's got to be about Hamilton, I think, because because there's just so much leverage in that decision relative to to who. So we're we're kind of set up for this. But let's say there are four possibilities in the universe of decisions the Ravens might make about this. And I think I I think that's not perfectly true, but let's let's say it is. So possibility number one, you might want to write these down because I'm going to ask you for percentages on each, and I can see you've been drinking. Well, I've been going on. So, <laughs> so possibility number one is keep Hamilton at slot corner. Okay. Okay. Possibility number two is use Humphrey at slot corner because you bring in another outside corner who really fits more there. And Peters is a perfect example of a player who fits on the outside. Yasin also on the outside. Humphrey would be the only guy to play slot if those are the three guys and they want them on the field in nickel situations. Mm-hmm. Number three is bring in a veteran slot corner who uh, heretofore we don't know who that is. So cheaper. There's certainly more choices. It's a very common body type. 
relative to outside corners, but that's choice number three. And choice number four, the job goes to somebody who's currently on the roster, and I think the top three candidates in order might be Pepe, Washington, and then I don't know, maybe Stevens uh, among non-Hamilton, non-Humphrey uh, cornerbacks. Okay, so Hamilton slot, Humphrey slot, outside slot, someone on the roster in the slot. Uh, out, out, right, outside the organization slot. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, or somebody, or, or and and then most of that, the most of that fourth category, I think, is going to be Pepe being the the starter. I think you you got to believe in him if you want to kind of take a chance. If, I think they're actually going to because they're going to want to learn to play defense together. They're going to want to have Hamilton in whatever role he ends up at at first, which kind of commits you to a slot corner that might be Pepe. Now, of course, you could yeah. move Humphrey. They got one guy you could move there is Humphrey if you go out and get Peters. Yeah, the other the the the, the thing for me about I think the thing about this is breaking this down. I, okay, so I'm going to say the outside slot corner. I think that's the 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 least likely. Option. Okay, give me a number on on that. So I'll say ten percent outside. Ten percent. Okay. So I'll go. So I'll go. So this is how I think they start the season. So I'll go forty percent Hamilton in the slot. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then Humphrey with another big outside corner. Is yeah. Is pr and then probably someone else on the roster I'll go at um, 30%. Um, and, then, and then Humphrey in the slot at 30%. 30, 30. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. So I'll go 25 and 25 Humphrey or someone on the roster. In 25 the and 25. So, okay. So, so yeah, I didn't. I think. I think Hamilton is most likely the one interesting part about the, the like the, the people on the roster is Trayvon Mullen has a guaranteed contract. So I'm really curious what they're going to do with him. Fifth, fifth, uh, it's, he has a gu absolutely guaranteed contract. I'm pretty sure he signed fully guaranteed. I mean, it's not a whole lot of money and it could just be because he's related to Lamar, but he's no, I need to look it up because I don't believe it. Um, you are correct. It is fully guaranteed, man. No, didn't didn't know that. So that's a that's definitely something that they would want to do. They're going to have to trade him. That means uh, if they if they can't find a roster spot for him. So that's that makes him a serious seriously significant camp uh, camp watch. Thanks for that, Brad. That's that's new information to me. Sorry, I, I should have brought that up earlier. I'll, I'll, I'll just say you, you had 40, 25, 10, and 25. I, I'm very similar. I have 40 to keep Hamilton there, so I think that is the plurality decision here. Twenty, to, I'm sorry, 15 to use Humphrey uh, in the slot and get another outside corner. I think they'd rather just have three outside corners because their depth there just sucks right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, bring in a vet slot cornerback I have at 25. And so I think that's the second most likely. And then the job goes to Pepe Washington Stevens, or maybe even somebody else that we don't know on the roster currently is 20. Yeah. So very similar, the, the two of us. But but I did have the second most likely being the bring in the vet slot corner. Yeah, I, I don't I just don't know what guys are out there. And Hamilton was so productive there last year. Mm -hmm. I, I understand wanting to move him back, but I mean they were they were playing really good down the stretch. Yeah, and that does allow you to play Geno Stone. So in an all other things equal situation, I don't have a problem with that discussion, but Stone is a one-year player with the Ravens. If he if he goes back and he plays strong safety exceptionally well, if he plays the back end on cover two, if he does the things he basically did with Marcus Washington, there's a chance he's the Ravens just end up losing him anyway. If he, if he stays, they keep him in a more limited role. He could become one of these rotating two-year veteran guys where he stays captain of special teams here. Um, but a player like that, you will lose him if he has another vet offer for twice the vet minimum. So a $2 million offer takes him out of Baltimore. Um, a, a, I mean, I guess the Ravens could match that, you know, but but I think it's it's probably unlikely. I think it's probably gone. If if the offer is you know between a two and four hundred thousand dollars signing bonus, sure he might stay with Baltimore. Mm -hmm. He might say this is my better chance to play more years, but uh, 
But I, I you know, his play going in there and playing for Marcus Williams was so good. And I get a sense you you're buying into some of that too, yeah. that, that I'm um, I would be really loath to give up on that. I just, I think the decision on Hamilton has to be the, the, the centerpiece to this whole discussion. You got one incredibly talented player. He's, he stands head and shoulders literally. And, and, and uh, you know, in, in terms of talent above the others and it, the decision has to be made on him first. That's fair. The one roster building point about this, that when I asked you the question of who you would bring in, if you could only sign yep. a, a player from one of the position groups, I was thinking about how in, in the 21 off season, we really kind of, tried to piecemeal offensive tackle together. Stanley never came back and the tackle situation with Villanueva on the left was, you know, summary in the team. Mm -hmm. Uh, Last year they tried to piecemeal together the wide receiver position. Bateman goes down and that really submarines the team. And, you know, this year the, the I'm I'm concerned that we are piecemealing a little bit uh, the cornerback position. And absolutely. And I mean, <laughs> we've just had some seasons, like uh, more seasons than not have been submarined by cornerback injury. And, and so I'm starting to feel a little concerned about that. And, you know, we're talking, this podcast is to talk about Pepe. Maybe yeah. he's the one that steps up and he can really show out in his second year. I, I That would be fantastic. Obviously did. Let's jump right into that with a good season for Pepe Williams. What does it look like? So I think a good season uh, in the preseason, he shows progress um, in the slot and he makes the team uh, comfortably. And he is a guy that can rotate in um, in multiple receiver sets to either play the slot and nickel or dime packages uh, without too much, you know, feeling like he's too much of a liability. And it allows Hamilton to play more of that safety role more often and not be tied into the slot, but just that he is a, fourth fifth cornerback piece that can rotate in comfortably and we don't feel that he's going to get picked on immediately but frankly i think that's a good season for him yeah i I think that's that's fair i've got something very similar makes the team as a backup slot corner see playing time on a rotational or matchup basis it could be something that they get hamilton some back end snaps they actually you know use a two out of three of stone hamilton and pepe on per play and they allow it to be dependent whether it's 12 personnel which 12 personnel is probably going to be base with with hamilton just up there in a tight end's face a lot of the time but yeah it it gives it gives an option for him to get on the field uh size does not show up regularly as a problem that's something i want does does enough that he's still in consideration for 2024 i've got no specific requirement for coverage other than i would like it to be near average you know, he's pretty bad this last year. Um, if he could improve to near average, I think that would be a lot. And I think the Ravens would potentially harvest a big gain from that. And this is a, this is a position you're talking about, you know, how they're cobbling together a secondary here. This is a wins above replacement situation. It's not a, you've got to be average situation. This is the, the Ravens season could be, could be summary torpedoed, whatever you want to call it by having a guy who's at the replacement level at slot corner. Um, and I, I actually don't think the Ravens will allow that to happen because they can make changes on their own team to do it. But it's it definitely – if you run out of moves to make once you get to a certain point in terms of, of, uh, of uh, total secondary depth. How about a great season? Totally. What does that look like? So I think a great season is coming out of camp. He is – um, pretty much the clear slot cornerback in situations where they they clearly want Hamilton on the back end, and so you know he's like a he's first or second choice in this scenario, and we're not primarily looking at Hamilton in the slot. We're primarily looking at Pepe, and he can solidify himself in that role. I, I'm I'm basically very similar. I say another fine camp preseason makes the Ravens give him the slot cornerback job as Hamilton has moved to a full-time strong safety role. Pepe does enough to hold it for most, if not all, of the season. Slot coverage is league average, and I'm okay even if that's multiple players. Him and other players are providing a league average total at, in, in terms of coverage out of the slot. He plays solid downhill football despite his size. Tackling's not an issue, and he contributes to one to two turnovers. That's a lot of 
like spare change in there. But I think we we're talking in this case about, you know, a 400 to 600 snap season from Pepe, maybe even more than that if he if he were to fulfill these kind of things. So he really should make some plays in that period of time because the Ravens do a lot with their slot corner. Absolutely. And he started last season playing between 40 and 60 percent of the snaps for the first six or so games and then just mm-hmm. stop. So if he starts on that trajectory and continues, I think he'll get close to that 600 snap season you're talking about. All right, Brad, outstanding to have you on. Always a lot of fun to talk football with you. And this was this is an interesting pair to talk about. And, and you know, I've, I'm watching something on TV about Welcome to Wrexham, by the way, a show about yeah. the have, – have you heard about it, the Hulu yeah, show? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, we have it a meet the, meet the previous – general manager, I don't know, managing director, I think it was his actual title, who's in the show on our, on our trip just now. He's, he's in our Jeep, you know, every day. And we're, <laughs> we got to talk a little bit about this. And uh, uh, it, it, was, it was really interesting that that uh, uh, they really get into how the fans are just consistently whining about everything. You know? And I think that's part of the fun we have is we have to complain and worry uh, excessively, even though there's really obviously nothing we can do about it, but we can we can talk about it. We can, you know, <laughs> debate it a little bit. And these are a couple of guys I think who are, uh, as you said right up uh, up front, are, are on the margin. They're they're both. Neither of them is guaranteed a roster spot uh, as the season goes on. Pepe's probably got the better chance of the two to make the team, um, but even he is not a sure thing. If they bring in people from the outside, they may suddenly you know, find a practice squad spot for Pepe as opposed to a, a 53. Well, in this time of year, it's all about, we're typically uh, flush with optimism. So we always <laughs> want to be a little bit pragmatic as we come at this. On the other hand, you've been doing that one play episode uh, series for a while. And so many of those guys who made those critical plays were guys on the margin. So these guys do and can really matter. Um, it's just a matter of they need to they need to seize the moment. There this. you go. We'll just we'll just remind remind them to be Anthony Mitchell at the right time, and they'll be fine. <laughs> anyway, Brad, Brad, great having you on again. Uh, tell folks where they can talk football with you online. I am MC Bradley on Twitter. Okay, Mick Bradley. That's pretty easy to remember. Other folks out there, if you'd like to be on a film study short, hit me up. July's the time. Uh, I still have a f- couple of pairings left if anyone would like those uh to do for the for the remainder of this series hit me up with a dm on twitter they're always open i'll get back to you very quickly uh other topics are fine as well brad thanks again for coming on thanks ken we'll talk to you next time on film study